Vladimir Vladimirovich, there have already been a billion views of your interview with Tucker Carlson. There are many different responses. Positive. And it is clear what comments are coming from Western leaders. The British Prime Minister, the German Chancellor, they called, I quote, your attempt to explain the reasons for the start of the special operation, to justify it with the threat of a NATO attack on Russia, ridiculous and absurd. What do you think about such assessments? First of all, it's good that they watch and listen to what I say. If today, for some reasons related to them, we are unable to conduct a direct dialogue, then we should be grateful to Mr. Carlson for the fact that we can do this through him as an intermediary. So what they are watching, listening to is good. But the fact that they distort what I said is bad and distort the map. Why? Because I didn't say anything like that. I did not say that the beginning of our special military operation in Ukraine is connected with the threat of a NATO attack on Russia. Where is it in my interview? And there is a record. Let them show me exactly where I said this. I was talking about something else. I said that we were constantly deceived from the point of view of not expanding NATO to the east. By the way, this was said first of all through the mouth of the then Secretary General of NATO, and he was a representative of the Federal Republic of Germany. That's what he said, not inches to the east, then five extensions. Complete deception. Of course, we were concerned and are concerned about the possibility of Ukraine being drawn into NATO, since this threatens our security. That's what I said. But the immediate trigger was the complete refusal of the current Ukrainian authorities to implement the Minsk agreements, and the incessant attacks with numerous human casualties on the republics of Donbass, the Luhansk People's Republic, and the Donetsk People's Republic, which we have not recognized for eight years, which eventually asked us for recognition in the form of the futility of resolving issues within the framework of the Minsk agreements. We they were recognized, then signed a contract with them, known for friendship and mutual assistance. And in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations, we have fulfilled our obligations under this treaty. As I said, we did not start the war, but only try to stop it. At the first stage, we tried to do this through peaceful means, with the help of the Minsk agreements. As it turned out later, we were led by the nose here too, because both the former German Chancellor and the former French President recognized and directly publicly stated that they were not going to fulfill these agreements of ours, but simply bought time in order to pump up the Ukrainian regime with additional weapons, which they successfully did. The only thing we can regret is that we did not start our active actions earlier, believing that we are dealing with decent people. After all, Carlison was criticized immediately before the interview and after the interview, he is now being blamed for allegedly asking few tough questions, allegedly he was too soft with you, and you were very comfortable with him. And that's how you think, have you crushed an American journalist with your authority? I think that your Carlson, when I say yours, I mean that he is the chairman of your journalistic workshop, a dangerous man. And here's why. Because, to be honest, I thought that he would behave aggressively and ask these so-called sharp questions. I was not just ready for this, but I wanted it, because it would give me the opportunity to respond sharply as well, which, in my opinion, would give a certain specificity to our entire conversation. But he chose a different tactic. He tried to interrupt me several times, but still, surprisingly for a Western journalist, he turned out to be patient, listened to my lengthy ideologies, especially concerning history, and did not give me a reason to do what I would be ready for. Therefore, frankly speaking, I did not get full pleasure from this interview.
but he went hard, judging in his own way. Speaking of which, according to his plan. And he carried out his plan. But as far as it was ultimately meaningful, it's not for me to judge. These are just viewers, listeners, maybe readers of the received material, they should draw their own conclusion. After this interview, calls immediately began to sound for sanctions against Tucker Carlos, and in general, there are conversations that he could almost be arrested there. Is that even possible? Assange is sitting and that's it. And almost no one remembers about him anymore. Only his close people talk about it as they say, and that's it. That's it. These are the features of public consciousness. Here the topics go, and that's it. But however, Assange was at least accused of giving away some state secrets. It's hard for Carlson to stick it on because he didn't touch any secrets at all. Nevertheless, probably theoretically, everything is possible in today's America, in today's United States. From Carl's own point of view, it would be said. I don't envy him, but it's his choice. He knew what he was going for. But from the point of view of making people all over the world understand what a modern liberal democratic in quotation marks dictatorship is, which is vividly represented in today's ruling class of the United States, but it would probably be nice. They would have shown their true face then. Carlson said that after the interview, just so that now, maybe, to dispel the doubts that have arisen, that's my question. Carlson said that after the interview had another conversation. Now everyone is interested in what? Well, he's some. He went through his plan, as I have already said, and as I understood. And that's it, I didn't go beyond this plan. There were some other topics, for example, that I think it would be important to talk about, but I did not wind up additional topics that a journalist did not raise with me in a conversation with me. Therefore, here is the question of demonizing Russia, connected well with the same intrathnic events. With the Jewish pogroms in the Russian Empire, they should have arisen during such an official part. One of the topics that we talked about with him when the cameras were turned off is exactly what the United States Secretary of State was talking about. He spoke about it several times, Mr. Blinken, that his relatives, his great-grandfather fled from Russia, from the Jewish pogroms. And in different countries of the world, in Europe, in the States, this topic constantly arises. I repeat, it arises in order to demonize Russia, to show what barbarians live here, what scoundrels and robbers live here. In fact, if you look at what today's Secretary of State said, and look not at the political slogans, but at the essence of the problems that took place, then a lot of them here becomes clear. Well, for example, we have all this in our archives. Mr. Blinken's great-grandfather really left the Russian Empire. He was born, in my opinion, somewhere in the Poltava province, and then lived and left Kiev. A question arises. Mr. Blinken believes that this is a native Russian territory, Kiev and the surrounding area are the first. Second, if he says, that he fled from Russia from the Jewish pogroms, then at least, at least I want to emphasize this. He believes that there was no Ukraine in 1905th year, in 1904th year. Namely in 1904th year, Mr. Blinken's great-great-grandfather left Kiev for the United States. It means that there was no Ukraine there, if she says that he fled from Russia. Apparently, Mr. Blinken is our man.
only in vain he makes such public statements. This can lead to failure. The other day, the German media, the German media published articles that the grandfather of the current German foreign minister, Shilina Burbuck, he was an ardent Nazi. And, considering everything that has been going on in relations between our countries in recent years, it turns out that, perhaps, at some genetic level, such a virus of National Socialism is transmitted in this country? Well, this is also one of the subspecies of extreme nationalism. By the way, if it occurred to me now about these pogroms, they mostly took place in the Russian Empire, in the south-southwest, on the territory of today's Ukraine. Here in Kiev, I said, in 1905th year. If Mr. Blinken's ancestor left in 1904, then the first pogrom in Kiev was such a massive one in 1905. So his great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather could only find out about it either from the newspaper or from the information that came from Kiev at that time. And so they, in principle, such mass negative events arose at the beginning of the 19th century, in my opinion. In 1920th 21st year, the first pogrom was so massive. Of course, these crimes were committed in Odessa. Then in Melitopol, in Zhytomyr, in other cities of today's Ukraine. We were in Belarus. There were a couple of similar events in Siberia, but the first one was connected with the murder of the Greek patriarch Constantinople. And then, the Greeks who lived there considered that the Jews were somehow involved in the attempt on the patriarch. But it doesn't matter, but what is important is that, by the way, the resistance squads, which consisted of Jewish and Russian youth, opposed the pogroms. The government gave appropriate assessments, even the Tsarist won, and tried to prevent these tragic events, including with the help of the army. But, I repeat again, this is a separate topic. And as for nationalism and Nazism fascism, you know, I'll tell you, maybe, a strange thing. Well, first of all, the lady herself, how, and not to be mistaken, her last name. She represents the Green Party. Many representatives of this part of the political spectrum of Europe, they speculate on people's fears and inflame these fears of people before the events that may occur in the world in connection with climate change. And then, speculating on these fears and fueled by themselves, then they pursue their own political line, far from what they came to power with. This is what is happening in Germany now. Let's say coal generation has increased. It was larger than in Russia in the structure of energy. And it was more, and now it has become even more. Well, where is the green agenda? This is the first thing. Secondly, secondly, people like the German foreign minister, they are, of course. In this case, of course, she is hostile to our country, to Russia, but in my opinion, she is also hostile to her own country, because it is difficult for us to imagine that a politician of such rank treated the interests, the economic interests of his country, his people with such disregard. I'm not going to go into details right now, but in practice, this is exactly what is happening, and we see it. But the next part of what I want to say may sound like a dissonance to what I just said. I do not believe that today's generation of Germans should bear full political responsibility for everything that Nazi Germany did. It is impossible to shift responsibility for what Hitler and his henchmen did to the people of today's generation. And not only in Germany, but also in other parts of the world, Europe and so on. I think that would be unfair. And in general, sculpt this label for the whole German people. This is not a fair position. This is abuse. 
abuse of that by what the peoples have experienced. The peoples of the Soviet Union survived. It seems to me that this is, well, disrespectful, and there's no need. It is necessary to proceed from the realities of today, to look at who really does what, and what kind of policy they pursue. In this regard, by the way, in my opinion, it would be useful to do this. In my opinion, many people are now in many countries, even in those in which it would seem. This should not sound like a political leitmotif, but it sounds, unfortunately. What do I mean by that? Some kind of exclusivity of some peoples in front of friends, some kind of selectivity and so on. But listen, this is where Nazism began. Therefore, if this is so widespread, we should also, in any case, think about building this anti-fascist, anti-Nazi propaganda, and work at such a global level, I repeat, on a global level. And moreover, it should not be. It should not be done at some state level. This will be effective only if it is done at the level of public consciousness and public initiative. And it doesn't matter in which country of the world it happens. In the European Union as a whole, at the same time, almost panic began in connection with the possible return of Donald Trump to the post of us president. And the recent statements, just the other day they were, the European leaders were generally discouraged by Trump, they did not hide it. Trump said that the US should protect European countries only if European countries pay for it. That is why in general, such a relationship has developed between Europe, European leaders, politicians, and Donald Trump. Trump has been called a non-systemic politician all the time. He has his own view on the topic of how his relations with their allies should develop in the United States. Sparkles after all before. Take this, take the withdrawal of the United States from the Kyoto Agreements in the field of ecology. It was also sparking at that time, but the then President of the United States decided that the United States would withdraw from these agreements despite the attractiveness of the environmental agenda because he believed that this was harmful to the American economy. Well, that's it. I made a military decision to do with the end and how the European leaders didn't swear at him there. He did it. Yes, I corrected it later. And what is the difference between Trump's position in this sense? Yes, nothing in principle. He wanted to force the Europeans to raise their defense spending, or as he said, let them then pay us for protecting them, for opening an atomic umbrella over their heads and so on. Well, I don't know, let them figure it out for themselves, that's their problem. Well, probably from his point of view, there is some logic in this. From the point of view of the Europeans, there is no logic at all, and they would like the United States to continue to carry out some functions that have developed since the formation of NATO, free of charge. This is their business. I think that NATO is no longer needed at all. There is no sense at all. There is only one meaning, it is an instrument of us foreign policy. But, if the United States believes that they do not need this tool, but this is their decision. And the current US President Biden gives more and more reasons for the whole world to discuss his health every day. This is the president of one of the largest nuclear powers, and at the same time, we all actually observe, to put it mildly, extremely specific shots on a daily basis. When you see and hear all this, what do you think about? I think that the US domestic political campaign, the election campaign, is gaining momentum. It is becoming more and more acute, and it is incorrect for us, in my opinion, to interfere in this process. Listen, when I met Biden in Switzerland, it was, however, a few years ago, three years ago, and then it was already said that he was incapacitated. I didn't see anything like that. Well, yes, 
he was spying on his piece of paper. To be honest, I was spying on my own. There is nothing like that. But the fact that he somewhere, getting out of the helicopter, hit the head of this helicopter. But who hasn't bumped his head somewhere? That is, let the first throw a stone at him and so on. In general, in my opinion, I am not a doctor, and I do not consider myself entitled to make any comments on this. We should not look at this, we should look at the political position. I believe that the position of today's administration is extremely, extremely harmful and erroneous. And I told President Biden about this at the time. Well, then the question that was four years ago, and now it turns out, is becoming relevant again. Who is better for us, Biden or Trump? Biden. He is a more experienced person, he is predictable, a politician of the old formation. But, we will work with any US leader who is trusted by the American people. And, I would like to return to your interview with Tucker Carlson again. We recalled the statements of the current leaders of Germany, Great Britain, but the one you told Carlson about in an interview was also spoken out, and where is this Johnson now? It was he, as follows from Arakami's confession statements, who told Kiev not to negotiate with Moscow, but to fight. Now, if the Kiev authorities had not listened to these, let's say, tips, how could events have developed further? So Mr. Arahami, I said it myself. He's the same. Well, look at the synchron. We didn't pull his tongue, he said what he thought. Why he said that, I do not know, but he is such an outspoken person. But he also said that if we had fulfilled those agreements, went to the full implementation of those agreements that arose in Istanbul, the war would have stopped a year and a half ago. He said so. It is necessary. That's when Mr. Carlson's interview is going on. It seems to me that Mr. Arakami should be given synchronously. Why did the West take such a position? I say the West and above all, the Anglo-Saxon world, because the former Prime Minister Mr. Johnson could not come on his own initiative without consulting Washington on this matter. Surely there were not only such consultations, but I think he just went on a business trip, at the expense of the American administration. They paid him a business trip for it. There he outlined the position that it was necessary to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian, it was in the Ospreys, of course, but to the bitter end, and inflict a strategic defeat on Russia. But apparently, they were counting on such a result. But since I told Mr. Carlson, can I repeat it to you? Well, if they see that the result does not work, apparently, you need to wear adjustments. But that's the question. It is a question of the art of politics, because politics as we know, is the art of compromise.